Heart attacks? Yeah. Um, 1986. Uh, April. I don't remember April what, just April. Um, I'd done Balticon. The next week I had gone and been a guest of honor at a little convention in um, Upper New York State. Came back and had moved my office from D.C. to Beltsville. And I had a trade show uh, that I was supposed to be working the following day, Monday night, and I was, of all things, trying to teach myself WordPerfect 4.0. WordPerfect 4.0? WordPerfect 4.0. Not sure what that uh, is. It was a word processing system, or word processing program. Um, at the time, it was probably the one most used by professional writers. Um, and WordPerfect Corporation still exists, and they're up to like version 15, but it was before Microsoft Word. Actually, it's a much better program than Microsoft Word. Logical. Most of the law firms in the country still use WordPerfect, and in fact, they may use older ones because, as one lawyer pointed out to me, the licenses have been paid for for years. It does everything we need to do to produce legal documents, and everybody from the senior partner to the secretary can use it. And the neat thing about WordPerfect, WordPerfect 15, or X5 as they're now calling it, will read and save all previous WordPerfect formats down to 5.1 for DOS. For DOS? For DOS. Disk operating system. That was before Windows. And it will save all the Windows versions. Oh, and by the way, it will read and save versions of Microsoft Word that Microsoft Word won't read. So, definitely a superior program. Anyway, but I'm trying to be self-taught, you know, with a word processing program. I moved the office. I put out my 40th cigarette of the day. I drained my ninth or tenth mug of coffee that I had had that day. And I walked downstairs and I came to Bobby, who was down here reading, and said, um... What are the symptoms of a heart attack? Because I've got this chest pain, and she asked me some questions, and she said, fine. I said, so I, I guess I just strain things moving? She said, no, it means I have enough time to drive you to the hospital. Yeah. She was a doctor's daughter. And on the way out the door, I stopped over there and I grabbed a new pack of cigarettes and put them in my pocket because I had just finished my second pack of cigarettes for the day and you didn't, if you were as inveterate a smoker as I was, you didn't leave the house without a pack of cigarettes. So we went down the road to Howard County General and um, she pulled up in front of the emergency ward and I got out and, uh, excuse me, somebody's buzzing me. No, I'm not going to be able to do that. That's in Pennsylvania. An invitation to somebody's birthday party this oh. evening in western Pennsylvania. No, I'm not going to. Um, anyway, uh, the, uh, I guess I looked bad. Let's say I was 47 years old. Uh, because all I know is I came in and I said, I'm having some chest, and before I could even get pains out, the gal leapt out from behind the counter, snapped open a wheelchair, kicked my feet out from under me, and ran me into critical care. So there I am, I'm lying on the table. Um, they've got me hooked up to all sorts of machines. The and turn comes in says, well, we just got the blood chemistry back. You're having a heart attack. And I said, oh. And I 
reached into my pocket and I took out the unopened pack of cigarettes and I handed them to Bobby and I fumbled around and found my lighter and I handed it to her and I said, there, one way or another I quit. And she said, what do you mean one way or the other? And I said, well, I'm either leaving here vertically or horizontally, but in either case, I've had my last cigarette. And uh, so I was in the hospital for 10 days, uh, which in those days, most of it on a morphine drip, which made life, you know, <laughs> very pleasant, sort of floated through it. And uh, that was the last time I had a cigarette. Bobby, who also smoked, came home, smoked every cigarette in the house, and told the family doctor she needed the uh, prescription for the, uh, the, the Nicorette gum. And it took her several years before she ever stopped having a desire for cigarettes. Um, it's very, very addictive. Um, it's, and particularly what the tobacco companies did some years ago when they really started breeding the tobacco to get more nicotine, you know, more fix. Um, it's probably as addictive as heroin. Um, but So, fine, I lived through that. I went back to work. They blamed it on smoking, uh, not eating regularly, and high-stress jobs. So I took stress management course, and I the exercise and they didn't let me have any caffeine for two years along with the nicotine. That was hard. That was harder than giving up the tobacco. And two and a half years later I had a second heart attack. Um, Danny was going into the service. There was a birthday party for him at Friends in Laurel and having chest pains and I'm denying to myself that I'm having a heart attack because I was new. I had done all the things they told me to. The only drug they put me on was aspirin as a blood thinner and I couldn't be having a heart attack, right? In fact, they'd been on a low-fat, low-everything diet because uh, Bobby was trying to lose weight. And Finally, I admitted to myself that I was having a heart attack just about the time that the daughter of the people whose house we were at, who was a nurse, looked over at me and said, you are gray and sweating, you're having a heart attack, and <laughs> took me to Greater Laurel Beltsville Hospital, which was two minutes away. And I was lying there, and my cardiologist came in, I looked up at him and said, damn it, Jerry! I did everything you told me to. Why is this happening? He says, we're going to get you through it. We'll find out. Decide it's a genetic predisposition to placking the arteries. Uh, again, um, went through no operations, no opening, because where the heart muscle was damaged really didn't lead itself to uh, do a bypass. And got out of the hospital. Of course, they measured everything, and in the hospital, heart patients died and so on. And I had a cholesterol level of um, 214. Is that low or high? 200 was considered the dividing line there, so it was slightly elevated. And um, three weeks later, and again, I'm on the heart patient diet and so on the whole time. They had me go do another blood test, and it was 241. And said, okay, it's genetic predisposition. Started me on one of the statins, statins, the pill. It's a, it's a class of drug that's to lower the cholesterol. On it five weeks, and they want another blood test because it can affect the liver. Uh, in my case, it didn't. Uh, but my cholesterol level was 150 and it has stayed significantly below 200 ever since. Um, and I take one 40 milligram uh, pill of, right now it's Lipitor, but whatever the uh, statin of the month is, and it keeps the cholesterol level down, and that's fine. But 
February of last year, my cardiologist recommended that I have a defibrillator implanted because my heart rhythm has been weird all my life. And he said, look, you're 70 years old, you have a history of heart uh, attacks. Um, Two-thirds of the people who get them, they never go off, but it's prophylaxis. You know, it's like you're taking the step. Your insurance company and Medicare will pay for it, get it done. So since I figured he'd kept me alive for 25 years, that would be a good idea. So I had the hockey puck implanted. And I call it a hockey puck because it's about the size of a small hockey puck. It's right here. You can feel the lump. There's one wire that goes down into the heart, and if the heart rhythm gets too wacko, it gives it a slight shock and times it, brings it back into a regular beat. And so that was February. In and out of the hospital in two days. We went in on Tuesday morning, was home Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. No big deal. Fine. Last Thursday of June, I wake up in the middle of the night. I can feel the thing going off. And I think for a moment, say, well, I've had worse shocks than that, you know, doing electrical work around the house. I guess that's what it's supposed to be doing. Went back to sleep. One week later, same thing. Wake up in the middle of the night. Hockey puck's gone off. You know, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be doing this or not. Go back to sleep, wake up the next morning, call my cardiologist's office, describe it, and they said, well, Dr. Hendrickson, who's the guy who puts the thing in and reads it, is book solid next Tuesday. He's only here in Columbia on Tuesdays. Um, are you having any other problems? I, no. no. And they run through all the, the questions, and I'm answering no to all of them. They said, okay, well, tell you what, let's get you an appointment for a week from Tuesday, and uh, we'll have Hendrickson read the, the snitch report, and because it stores data. Oh. And they put sort of a contact modem on it, and then they query it, and it runs out a big long tape, and it tells you everything that the heart has been doing since the last time they read it, which I think is really cool, you know, but, but still snitching on me. So um, I go to New York to see Adam's Family, the musical, and um, I invited a friend of mine who lives in New York. I said, I'll swap you a night in your guest room for an orchestra seat ticket to see Adam's Family, the musical, because I'm I wanted to go see it. The critics panned it. I figured the show will probably die, and I wanted to see Nathan Lane and B.B. Newworth and the Adams Family. Um, Page informed me that, no, no matter what the critics said, it wasn't going to go away because Nathan Lane and B.B. Newworth had each signed a one-year contract to appear in it, and if they were there, the theater would be jammed. And it was, in full house. But anyway, we go to see Adams Family, the musical. We go out to dinner. I go to sleep in Paige's guest room, get up the next day. I had an appointment with a gal who was making a new vampire wig for me for um, late that afternoon, and then um, I was going to take the train back. So I'm running around New York in 90 degree weather, walking, going to museums and other things, go back to Paige's, pick up my luggage, go to the wig maker, get the final fitting, get on the train, come home. Tuesday, I go in, Hendrickson is reading the snitch report, and the frown is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'm thinking, this is not a good thing. Um, my lady friend, when she met Hendrickson for the first time when we left, she goes, is he old enough to drive? I mean, he's an associate professor at Johns Hopkins, but very young looking to old farts like me, you know, and I mean, it's the Grand Canyon between his eyes. So, um, he reads this thing and he looks at me, he goes, you know, when you got an old house, and I didn't realize he was comparing me to an old house, <laughs> he said, when you got an old house, it's probably a good idea to fix the plumbing before you worry about the electrical. I said, well, that makes sense, yeah, he said, so I want you to have a heart catheterization. Okay, 
you know, you're going to do it over here? And he said, no. He said, um, why don't you go up to Hopkins? Said, well, okay, why? He said, well, if, you know, we decide we have to put a stent in or something like that. They can do it at the same time, you know, if they find uh, the blockage, where if it's Howard County, we'd have to take you back, we'd have to send you to Hopkins, and they have to open you up again and do all that. What I did not know or understand was basically I was a candidate for uh, sudden, what do they call it, sudden cardiac attack. The ejection fraction, the amount of blood that was coming out every time my heart was pumping, was down in the 20% range. And if that happens, they've got 10 minutes to save your life. Any longer than that, you're dead. You're dead. But nobody bothered to tell me that. So, you know, fine. I mean, this is Tuesday, Friday, I'm at Hopkins in the morning, I go up, they prep me, they put me out. I wake up sometime in the afternoon, there's some surgeon standing at the foot of the bed in recovery, grinning from ear to ear, and I said, so, okay, so what did you find? He said, oh, you have two and a half blocked arteries, you're scheduled for triple bypass next week. <laughs> oh? And goes off. Not do you want or anything else. No, you're scheduled for triple bypass next week. So I said, oh, okay. Um, I was scheduled for the following Wednesday and I came home and made sure that my will was up to date and everything set out for my son. If I don't make it back here, if we read this and do what, you know, big envelope of stuff. And felt fine. Got a call on Monday that they were going to postpone my triple bypass something more important had come up. I had to ask them what was more important than triple bypass, and they said uh, complete transplants. Uh, apparently a bus, uh, there was a bus car, bus truck collision on I-95. A bunch of people who were organ donors were killed. They had every surgical suite at Hopkins in use doing full organ transplants. But they had me in at uh, 5 o'clock the following Monday morning. And, you know, I went in and they did their thing. And, you know, I got a scar from here to here. I called my, my run-in with Dr. Van Helsing. Um, and they glued me and stitched me back together. And they tied my rib cage back together with titanium wires about the size of uh, uh, hangers. Go close hangers. So every so often I'll bend and it will sort of go click. Uh, I know your mom knows. I don't know if they still do them. The little clickers we had as kids to crickets. They made yes. noise and just we go still click, use them click. for dog training. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I will. It feels like that that I'm going click click. You know, I nobody else can hear it. I can hear it or feel it or something. And find out it's perfectly normal and don't worry about it. Um, so anyway, they do the triple bypass, everything's fine, go down, I'm in the hospital for nine days, um, ten days, whatever. They send me home, I have no strength, I have absolutely no stamina, you know, it's going to take a while, and they're on a bunch of meds, and I make it from the bedroom on the second floor down here and eat something for breakfast and then sit in the chair and Okay, you know, so I guess we'll come. And they have a visiting nurse coming in, checking on me and walking me around the downstairs, you know, to try and build some stamina. And I'm home a week. And all of a sudden I'm running 100 and some degree fever, pneumonia. Oh. Uh, or as the doctor at Howard County General said, oh, you have HAP. HAP, H-A-P, Hospital Acquired Pneumonia. Apparently, it is so common that they have an acronym for it. So, I'm in Howard County General for four days while they pump me full of antibiotics. And now I'm back home and I feel even worse. The, I still have no strength, I have no stamina, everything tastes like crap because the antibiotics tend to do a number on your taste buds. And so I'm not 
eating anything. Um, lost almost 20 pounds from the time I went in with the for the triple bypass. And I'm thinking to myself, if this is the best I'm going to feel, why did they bother? You know, because no, I do not want. Do not want to be one of those little old men, you know, with the oxygen tank and the wheelchair. No. Uh, if I can't do the kind of things I enjoy, I really don't want to be around. And so as I say to my son, you know, I'm coming down, I'm sitting in the chair, and my big thing of the day is to try not to drool on myself. And then I get a Get Well card from a group that does haunt music. Um, and their girlfriends, and a bunch of other people that I didn't even know knew I existed. And I'm going, you know, this is sort of cool. I mean, I didn't know them. And then I get a little brown paper package, and it has Esther Friesner's return address on it. And I open it up, and it is the Esther Friesner edited a series of three suburban paranormal books. The first one was called Witch Way to the Mall, and it's all about witches in suburbia. And I forget the name of the second one, and it's all about werewolves. And the third one is about vampires. And it is called Fangs for the Mammaries. Okay. Yes. And so I open the brown paper package, and there's that, and there's a post it note on it, and it <laughs> says, Marty, read the dedication. So I open the book to the title page, and it says, for Marty, totally. I mean, come on, look at the dedication page, man. <laughs> Love and thanks, Esther. So, of course, because Esther told me to look at the dedication page, I finally went and... Hold on, it's a little bit higher. There it goes. It's because an anthology of funny stories about vampires in suburbia cries out or howls the moon for an eminently suitable dedicatee. It is with great respect, friendship, and appreciation for innumerable vampire jokes that we undedicate this book to Marty Gear, aka Vlad. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> undedicated to me! Undedicated. Undedicated to me. <laughs> and. Danny comes home, and I'm sort of dancing <laughs> with this little strength as I have around the house, going, Esther dedicated the book to me! Esther dedicated the book to me! And um, Danny looked at me and says, Feeling better, are we? <laughs> um, so I had an appointment with my cardiologist who looked at everything, and I said, Well, I, there's some things that I want to do. Uh, I've been asked to be a judge at New York Anime Festival the second weekend in... October, and I'd really like to go to Castle Blood. And he said, okay, you go to the hospital, you sign up for the um, cardiac rehab program, you be on it for at least two weeks, and then come back and see me, and I'll tell you what you can do if you want to keep me as your cardiologist. So I went and signed up, and they abused me, Bicycle, treadmill, free weights, crank things. Of course, the whole time I've got a wireless heart monitor on, three-lead heart monitor. Um, they're taking blood pressure every ten minutes. I'm with all sorts of other people who have had uh, heart conditions. Um, and I go back to him and he says, okay, fine, here are the restrictions. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. You need to eat three real meals, you need to get eight hours of continuous sleep in a bed, in a real bed, 
If you get tired, you are to stop whatever you're doing and sit down. And if you're willing to do that, oh, and you need to stay warm. And if you're willing to do that, then fine. Oh, and you keep going to rehab, um, you know, until you go. So the rehab sessions were Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, three times a week for 12 weeks. And so I arranged that I could go to New York on Friday for Anime Festival. I could go out to Pennsylvania the last two weeks in October on Friday and come back on Monday uh, in time to do my Monday rehab. Uh, and uh, so, you know, yeah, that's a life changer, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the scar is starting to fade, so I can't scare the grandkids anymore with it. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure I scared them in the first place, but I pretend that I have a 10 year old granddaughter who wants to be a vampire. Or a witch. She's not sure which. So, um, she reads anything that has print on it. So her birthday is the 22nd of December. I go down on the 23rd with a gift card to Barnes & Noble because there's a big Barnes & Noble in Lynchburg. And then on the 24th, we have to go to Lynchburg so she can use some of the gift card. Um, she buys some of the darndest books. Um, she decided last year, I don't know why, she wanted to teach herself French. So she bought a picture book that has English, French, and a much more advanced thing that came with a CD and a book, you know. Um, Ten years old. Why she wants to teach herself French? I have absolutely no idea. She wouldn't say, but that's what she wants. Fine. Good to learn languages early. Yep. Yeah. And uh, but she wanted a pair of fangs because she did a vampire at Halloween, but uh, the plastic, you know, people plastic fangs didn't stay and didn't work. And I said, okay. I'll make you a pair of fangs. So I brought all the fang crap down with me, and Christmas night took the impression. And the next day I'm sculpting the fangs, and she's glued to the table, watching the whole procedure. I think she was as fascinated by watching how it was done as she is with the fangs. And they fit, and she's going to be wonderfully evil <laughs> this Halloween. And in a couple of years, teeth will have changed, and I'll have to make her new ones, but that's okay. If she still wants them, I can do that. So anyway, you need to get your hair cut or something. We're All right. running about the time. Hopefully you've got enough stuff to come up with an interesting Probably. comic. Probably. Uh, thank you.